Hi everyone and thanks for joining us. My name is Anna Damoli and I'm an Italian visual designer and type design student currently living and working in Milan. Hello everyone, my name is Evgeny Yukechev. I'm a type designer, a typographer and founding editor of Shift Publishers, Moscow, Berlin. It's an honor to be a part of ATIPI this year for me and for us, for me and Anna. I wish you enjoy our presentation. In this presentation, we will reveal our experiences and discoveries from the year we spent reviving two Renaissance typefaces by Robert Grandjean under the supervision of Dr. Frank Blockland. This all happened at the expert class in type design course at the Plantin Institute of Typography. The aforementioned course is not a typical one, because it strongly ties the study of contemporary type design practice with a research on the centuries-old tradition, through inspection of available historic materials such as punches, smoke proofs, matrices, foundry type, and originally printed materials, and their profound examination. Frank Blockland was looking for a way which could have been used by punch cutters to define the body size and the intrinsically related proportions of letter forms in the context of supposedly existing space system, which in its turn could significantly reduce the time and costs of all the cycle of type production and typesetting. Looking at Textura, we see the following. First, the symbols are designed as if written by a broad nib, held with an angle of 30 degrees. Second, the width of each vertical stroke equals with each counter space, making it a one-to-one -one relation. Third, taking this equal width as a unit, we can say that Textura is a unified tie face. Finally, Frank declares that such a unification gave the Renaissance type producers and typesetters the fundamentals of classifying letters into groups of widths, measured in units, to make their work efficiently organized and clear. Jensen's type is considered to be the first successful attempt to produce a classical idiom of the Roman type. Its perfect rhythm, even of full justified typesetting, is charming, and its regularity of letter forms, as well as the proportions of letters, is astonishing. By analyzing its letter forms, we can also derive a width-related system, which can be divided into several letter groups as well. Although the shapes clearly differ, the morphology is essentially the same in texture and Roman type. Hence, the curved parts can be considered as overshoots of the straight strokes. Therefore, defining the side bearings of Roman type can be done in the same simple way as for textura type. This implies that the same groups of letters share the same character widths in both textura type and Roman type. The interconnections between calligraphy and movable type are many and multidirectional. Movable type was influenced by humanistic and writing and vice versa. But in Renaissance Roman type, the existence of an underlying pattern connected to the stand thickness of character is clearly visible. The stand width is used as the main base to build a grid of units and it's amazing to see how this results in a very precise reproduction of the type found in the printed matter. Thus, this methodology allows to reproduce the visual texture of historical type. The research at our course included examination of the punches, negative close-up photographs of the matrices, matrices themselves, and imprints. What was missing, and we thought what be crucial, was the foundry type itself, examining which could draw more light to the factual side bearings of the type. The red and white rectangles in the slide indicate the unit system that was distilled from historical materials. The video demonstrates a fresh take on the digital revival of Grand Jonas Skidonia Karamein. A group of four students, Sander, Walter, Matthias and Andy, undertook a deep investigation of the Roman typeface exclusively, analyzing the structure of the patterning, comparing original imprints, matrices and finally making a digital font. The comparison of historical prints, matrices and their digital font present a perfect match. On the left side is a fragment from Biblia Regia, on the right the matrices from Plantin Maretus Museum collection. The historical material is connected by the digitized Romaine, semi-transparent with a white outline. In terms of metrics, the digital font seamlessly corresponds with the historical print. The final character set of the digital revival of Grandjean Eschedonica Romaine by Sander, Walter, Matthias and Andy. And what about the italics? 
The research request of the last year expert class type design was to find out whether a cross standardization and cross unitization between the two types of Robert Grandjean was used. But why? There are some reasons to consider both Eschedonica types to be part of the very first attempts in the field of matching of Romans and Italics. Take a look at these two Eschedonicas. They don't seem to have common system, do they? Still, we wanted to find a patterning model, if any. Lowercase i seemed to be the only letter with fixed stroke thickness and angle. A 24 degree slanted grid conformed with it. Lowercase i's stem width taken as a grid interval. As a result, all the text lines on the examined page did fit into the grid. For example, notice several lowercase m's equal to 10 grid units in their widths. The stem of lowercase u's, m's and s's match the grid too. So do the strokes of the oval lowercase letters like c, e, a and p. With a transparent ruler and magnifying glass we noticed the matching of the x height at 3 mm and of the ascenders at 5. But the semi-ovals came as a surprise. In letters A, B, D, Q and P and even H their height was 1 quarter millimeter less. So we decided to address the matrices and photonegatives as more reliable sources. A side-by-side -side comparison of those negatives of Romain and Cursive revealed the ascenders, descenders and capitals heights sharing comparable vertical metrics, while the x height of Romain being notably higher than of the cursive. A difference in pace was also notable. While a line set in Romain displayed regularity and rhythm of stem and balls, it was harder to witness such regularity in cursive's powerful curves and miscellaneous angles of inclination. Matrices were our luckiest source of fine details, character of the type, peculiarities of letter forms, etc. First we used a slanted grid with 24 degrees angle and a stem width spacing for the lowercase and sorted the letters into width groups. At that time we still didn't understand how Grandjean worked with the side bearings of cursive and expected we would just add half of unit spaces on both side bearings. With the figure 3 we realized that the slant of extenders won't be calibrated optically but defined by units too with a decline from the grid by 1 to 2 units. Now we see the uppercase letters have a different slant. It is approximately 1.5 times less than of the lowercase, which makes it about 16th degree. Consequently, the stem is thicker, which leads us to calculating an individual grid space for the uppercase letters. So we switch to digital workflow, Glyphs app in our case, and divide the aforementioned unit into 66 glyph units. We also use a horizontal grid of 80 units for uppercase letters and 66 units for lowercase. We make it a refined grid with axis spacing twice less than 80 and 66 units respectively. Both grids differ horizontally but equal vertically. Now let's focus on spacing. Having no proof of Grandjean's calculations, our expectation was he added half of a unit to both side bearings. But after an accurate examination of letters in line, we noticed the so to say served sides, like in U, N, M, I, having no side bearings at all. They literally stand one right after another on the grid, while the rounded ones, like in Q, A, O, B, have a unit added to the round side. Here is an example of a lowercase a with side bearings of 1 unit on the left and 0 on the right side. It displays a quite regular rhythm. Now, if we think twice, the Renaissance sponge cutter could only cut the italics on rectangular metal bodies. The rectifying of the grid left the lowercase a remain perfectly fit in its place with 0 side bearings on both sides. Same effect for all other shown letters. We suggest that when designing italics it is helpful to use two unit arranged grids at the same time, a slanted one for drawing and a straight upright one to stay aware of proper side bearings. 
What if we put a remain letter in cursive surrounding remaining strictly in the grid? Yes, it fits the grid. Thus, we suppose cross standardization and cross unitization worked this way for Granjean. He could cut cursive using his calculations for remain, which had been released about a year earlier. At the end of all our experiments, we did the proof which could have been done at the very beginning of our journey. Back then it didn't seem rational, but now it looks like an obvious step we should start with. In short, if we take a stem grid of the Ascadonica remain based on the stem width of the lowercase i and slant it into 24 degrees, which is an approximate angle of inclination of the Ascadonica cursive, we can find out a perfect match of the grid with cursive text pattern. Now we reworked cursive by Romain's grid, readjusted the letter forms in their correct places on the bodies, made a fully calculated and adjusted model of the typeface with a simplified design, and compared it with the historical example. The result was a surprise. We see it as a basis for proving the cross standardization and cross unitization did exist, even though our research still requires further investigation. In the description of my personal project, I will tell you how this knowledge can be used in a contemporary type design practice, right after Anna presents her personal project. So, uh, now let's head to our personal projects, and I will start by telling you about mine. I decided to revive one of Francesco Griffo's italics, and as you might know, Griffo was a famous Italian punch cutter, also known for developing the italic style. The reasons why I decided to revive a model from Griffo were many. I was fascinated by the fact that he was a pioneer of his time and by how influential his italic style ended up being both to later punch cutters but even to nowadays italic. I felt this style very close to me, also as I've been studying uh, italic calligraphy for a couple of years now, and for the group projects of the ex expert class I was also reviving an italic. So we can say this image sums up pretty much my last year. At first I was concerned that working on italic for both projects was going to end up being an overlap in my learning journey. But I can honestly say it was really interesting to work on it and it turned out to be two completely different experiences and approaches as well. It wasn't easy to decide which italic model I was going to revive because actually in his career from 1501 to 1516 Francisco Griffo cut several italics, which turned out to be highly influential to the evolution of the italic style. So these are his first five italics, the ones he produced for third-part publishers, before he started his very brief career as a publisher himself. But among all, uh, Fanus Corsi, which was cut in 1503, is considered by Italian historians to be Griffo's best and most influential italic, which is why I decided to revive this specific model. It is named Fano, uh, as the name of the Italian city where it was designed and cut. And the first difference I encountered when starting to research material for my project was that no original matrices or foundry type are left of Griffo's work. And thus, I had to rely only on printed matter. So I had to find a book which contained the typeface I was reviving. This was the start of a very interesting journey to actually find a book containing that typeface. This is me browsing paper archives and handwritten catalogues in these very small Italian libraries to then find out that the book I was looking for was actually lost. So, well, this was, it was supposed to be there, but no one could really find it. I then found another copy which was in such bad conditions that when the librarian handed it to me, he said, I probably shouldn't even make you consult it. I then had to travel across Italy to find a better source for my revival. Which led me to Fano, the place where Griffo cut his italic and the place where I found a perfectly preserved book, completely typeset with the Fano cursive, and which served then as the main source of historical material for my revival. As I said, no foundry type or matrices are left of Griffo's work, and working with printed matter as a source was definitely a different thing. That's why I want to really highlight how important it was to me to find a properly preserved book, because that's all I could rely on to get information on the model. 
And here I want to show the different conditions of the books I consulted uh, and took pictures of. And this really shows how ink bleeding, paper and print quality can affect the overall perception of a model. Another fascinating feature of Glyphos Italic is how he actually cut different shapes for the same letters. And here you can see just a few examples of the over 60 variations among characters and ligatures that Griffos cut for the Fano Italic in his successful attempt to recreate a, a very lively pattern. That was a relevant feature, as we know the creation of Italic was inspired by Bartolomeo San Vito and writing and many others uh, Italian calligraphers of the time. So I started sketching by hand a uh, first group of letters in order to give my interpretation of what the model could look like in a digital environment and then moved those drawings in the font editor. So the research for an interpretation of letters that could be close to the model I was reviving was long and, and I really learned how to pay attention to details. One of the hardest things was to try to distinguish what was an imperfection of print and what was actually a feature of the model. And here you can see an evolution from the first digital sketch to the current design. But besides reviving the final cursive, I was also curious to investigate standardization within this model and see if Frank Blockland's theory applied to it. So I started by measuring and making clusters of letters based on width, um, plus side bearings and of course this is still a work in progress but what I found out so far is that uh, I'm able to fit all lowercase letters in five units groups as you can see here and the number of units is 24 uh, for one group 16 14 12 and 10 and here on the left you can see the units that I detected applied to the printed matter as I said previously, units not only include the width of the character, but also its intrinsic side bearings. And on the right, the same units are applied in the font editor, but for the sake of simplicity, in the font editor I use the uh, bigger size for the units. So for example, in this case I use the 8 instead of 16 for the G and the N, which both belong to the same cluster of letters. So I'm still researching and developing my personal project, even though the expert class has ended now and I would really like to complete my research. And here you can see a preview of what my typeface look like right now uh, in a big size. Uh, the spacing applied here is the one I detected from applying the patterning theory. And here's uh, an overview of the, of the text set in a size which is closer to the original printed matter that I used as a source. And now I will leave the word to Eugene and to his personal project. Christophe Plantin's magnum opus, Biblia Regia, is not only a monument of the publisher, but also a treasure trove of the works of many Renaissance punch cutters. Claude Garamond, Robert Ganjon, François Guillot, Pierre Patien, Hendrik van der Kerr, Guillaume Lebe, Thus, it couldn't serve better as a specimen for any type designer. The preface in Biblia Reggae is set in Grand Jean's Petit Canon Romain, cut in Lyon in 1547. In his The Paleotypography of the French Renaissance, Hendrik Verrier writes, The type appears in many German specimens, sometimes wrongly attributed to Garamond. English type historian Harry Carter judged this typeface not good enough to be cut either by Garamond or Grand Jean but there seems no reason to hesitate on an attribution to a young Grandjean. The typeface was widely popular among publishers across Europe, even by Venetian printers Paulus Manutius. A part of my project is a type family consisting of Grandjean's Petit Canon Romain, based on foundry type, with an accompanying Grandjean's Petit Parangon Italic, based on matrices, which was also used in Biblia Regia. The revival applies Frank Blockland's theory of patterning and cross-unitization to the design of both Roman and Italic styles. Work on the Roman style is a straightforward reconstruction, while the work on the Italic is more of an homage to Grandjean's design. Here we see a unit system based on the type parameters derived from the stem grid. One unit is equal to a stem width of the lowercase i. The vertical type metrics are 6 units for x height, 5 units for extenders, and 10 units for the uppercase. Here you can see the same method of examination of the main italics features. Tracing, drawing, or sculpturing. 
In his essay on drawing, John Berger writes, For the artist, drawing is discovery. And that is not just a slick phrase. It is quite literally true. It is the actual act of drawing that forces the artist to look at the object in front of him, to dissect it in his mind's eye and put it together again. Each mark you make on the paper is a stepping stone from which you proceed to the next, until you have crossed your subject as though it were a river, have put it behind you. Take a look at these figures. Number 4 is an example of close-up high-resolution images of the printed material used for type analysis, measurements and to get an overall impression of the Grandjean's type idiom. Figure 5 shows the original foundry type luckily available for examination of details, for comparing letter forms relations and for observing the consistency of type. Figure 6 is an example of my large drawings, about 10 cm tall, which I make as an act of experiencing the original idiom. I find this way a deeper one than just tracing of contours. Drawing played a crucial role in the process of my understanding of the typeface. As Berger says, artist looks at the object in front of him and discovers it. So, which object should we look at when drawing a historical typeface? My choice, we should look somewhat in between the type foundry materials and imprints. After finishing a rough drawing over a grid, I switched to software and built the letter forms trying to look simultaneously at three media. My drawings, close-up photos of imprints and digital microscope images of foundry type for the Roman and matrices for the Italic. This slide is very important. It gives the example of a type family designed with the cross unitization method. In two fitting grids, the upright one for drawing the Roman and calculating the spacing for both Roman and Italic, and the slanted one for drawing the Italic. The outcome of my personal project is a parametric type family which consists of three optical styles headline for large scales, origin for text type setting with corresponding Italic, and text style with shortened extenders and compact uppercase letters for more functional and neutral typesetting of running texts. Also, I would like to note that the credit for the parametric idea of this revival goes to one of Bram Deduce's type families, which I kept in mind working on the revival. So, here you can see a basic character set of the headline style of the type family. In the end, I should say that I am completely satisfied with how the patterning and the cross-unitization approach optimized my workflow. The spacing part is smooth and logical. My personal project is still in progress, but the highlights of my research in the frame of expert class type design by Frank Blockland helped me significantly improve my workflow and my understanding of the nature of type. Thank you.